So I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Carica. This is not a demo of Carica, although some think that it is. I will reference it because Carica addresses this problem, but I, I hope I don't end up trying to make this a sales pitch to you. That would be kind of rude of me, I think. Okay, I think the first question anyone asks is, why am I here? Why bother? Why should this subject be interesting to anybody? So I think the why is really, really important because it leads directly to the question of, okay, now how do I do it? So I'm gonna give you a few reasons because this doesn't work. Which side, which end of that hall do you suppose the bathrooms are located? <laughs> you gotta really hope there's more than one. <laughs> So uh, this was uh, a bright idea by a Swiss bank to create the largest trading room in history. And they did this, I think it was in the late 90s of early 2000, like right in the frenzy of the dot-com <coughs> boom. Everyone was thinking real big. A Couple of years ago, this is what it looked like. Oh, it's not a couple of years ago. I meant a couple of years later. Oh. Right? Like that earlier picture was the was a peak which they hit right away, and then we all, it was all downhill. Because, you know, the idea that you can cram, I don't know, a few hundred people into a, what is virtually one large work, workspace, um, it turns out that isn't doable and certainly is not scalable. And in fact, you have scaled beyond you what you should have done, right? So as you think about how organizations inevitably grow, we have to think about where you're gonna put every, everybody, right? And there's always some tension between, are you in the main building or the nearby building or the satellite building or like in another town? Because there is some anxi anxiety, which is understandable, I think, that if I'm really far away from the director of my agency, you know, there's a correlation between that and me being of any importance to the agency. It's an unfortunate one, but that exists. So everyone wants to be in that one big room where the director is. Can someone tell me where this picture was taken? The Mercer mess. <laughs> it is a perpetual traffic jam that has its own name. <laughs> you can Google it, Mercer mess, and you'll see this. This is Mercer Street in Seattle. People would like to leave Go north, go south, go anywhere, but leave the city. <laughs> you guys know what this is about. You know, yesterday I came in really bright and early to get here at seven, and it was a beautiful sight coming down I-5. On the other side, there are all these sparkling diamonds of headlights, <laughs> this magical carpet, and I thought, that looks really nice. <laughs> But the, you know, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and I was beholding it from the other side of the highway. <laughs> and I might have found the whole experience less joyful if I was sitting inside one of those shining points of delight, you know? <laughs> right? So this is not scalable. And certainly Seattle and Bellevue, and maybe even places around here, Tacoma certainly, have hit and gone through that what should have been a natural barrier. Here's a more positive reason. Um, this is somebody I've known as a customer and user for a few years, and this is her with her first baby. And by the way, uh, on our website somewhere, or on YouTube somewhere, we have a beautiful video that we shot at the same time that we made this video about what her experience was like and how she was able to have a very different kind of maternity leave <coughs> than people before her had. So I see a lot of ladies in the audience. Many of you may have gone through maternity leave. Um, yesterday I was speaking to two people about this thing, and one was older, so she, she took a maternity leave of six years by basically quitting her job. The other one took a maternity leave of one week because her boss wanted her back in the office. So neither of those two are really maternity leaves. One week isn't a leave, and six years, basically a change of career, is not a leave either. 
when I started work in the 80s, that was considered totally acceptable, right? I mean, we were all slaves to the organization. And I, for one, am really in favor of the millennials pushing back on the idea that their lives have to be controlled by the employers, right? So this is a reality. You may have faced personally, and certainly your colleagues are going to have to deal with as well. They cannot be in the office with you all the time. So what should they do? Should they quit and come back after six years? Should they handle the birth in one week, which seemed the two scenarios that I saw yesterday? Well, I don't think either of those two work. So that was my why. And I want to now segue a little bit into the lean model. Lean, you gotta remember, came from manufacturing, right? And in manufacturing, it's all about synchronicity. Can I get done with something just when you are ready to pick it up? Can that person pick, get done and then hand it off? Yeah? It's like a, an, an industrial ballet that you're trying to have of hundreds of people on the ballet, right? Where everything is perfectly aligned, perfectly synchronized. Would, I see a couple of nods in here, I'll go with that. Um, and this is what old school lean was trying to deal with. So old school lean was all about, okay, everyone's coming here and they're doing this one thing, we need to move that assembly line as well as you can. And so that also made sense in old school white collar work, right? You put lots of people in a room, they, they did essentially the same thing and it was all again about the assumption was we we're all working at the same time in the same place. So traditional teams and traditional project management, that whole thinking has been about a few assumptions baked into it. A traditional team is one team. It has clear edges. You're either in the team or you're not. A traditional team usually has one purpose. So everyone's working on this one thing. It most certainly has one location and it has one work day, whatever that is, nine to six or eight to five, you know, whatever it is. But everyone does the same thing in the same place in the same time. So this might be what a traditional organization looks like. You have some work that's gonna get done in Olympia, Project A, with all the folks there. Some work that needs to get done out of Yakima, Project B, those folks that are in Yakima, right? So it's like a really neat stacking of Lego blocks in a sense. The problem is knowledge work, which I think you're all doing because no one's showed up in overalls. Um, knowledge work is fundamentally asynchronous. Knowledge work is fundamentally not synchronous, but we are trying to do lean like they did it on the factory floor, but you are not on a factory floor. So yes, you can take lessons learned from the factory floor, but while remembering that you personally are not on a factory floor. Knowledge work today is separated by two factors. It's separated by time and by distance. So what I want to talk about is understanding that there's a separation that exists, understanding what the consequences of the separation are. Like what does it mean to be separated by distance? Separating by distance could simply mean Olympia to Tumwater or Olympia to Seattle. Separating by time means you have to work with somebody on the East Coast. If you want to consider a team that's separated by distance, you can imagine a team where there's maybe just one person in Olympia and the rest of the people are, you know, Yakima and Spokane, which actually doesn't sound that freaky now you think about it, right? Separating by time is more insidious. Let's consider somebody who lives close to work. That's when they come into work maybe, if they get up earlier than I normally do. <laughs> Right? So this lady is able to come into work around seven and maybe quit around 5.30 or so. Someone who simply lives further away, like on the wrong side of the highway in I-5, <laughs> is not going to have the same work hours. What about somebody who's in the field, an auditor who's out there doing an inspection, right? I mean, that's just one example. Nearly every agency does some kind of inspection as that as part of them, you know? Here's a real inspecting bunch of folks, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, 
if he's out in the field doing an inspection, his day will never really be synchronized with yours. For one thing, he might be inspecting in a town that he doesn't normally live in, right? Which may have changed his pattern and he's like, he used to be far, but now he's just, the motel is right across the street maybe. But there are other things that may change his pattern. And then we have flex. I, for one, as someone who worked too long in the old model, I'm really happy that flex time is being embraced more and more. So that person may work a half day on, let's say, Fridays. If this is a Friday schedule we're looking at, that person is only available for half a day, that's it. So what you now find is, if you try to find the common time for this team, it's a whole lot less than your work day, right? It might be just be 20 minutes before lunch and an hour or two after lunch. That's the only time you have even an opportunity to be synchronized with your folks. So time is not just necessarily because I'm over on, in, on the East Coast in New York, but it simply might reflect things that I'm doing differently within a few miles of Olympia. So if we accept that we have to deal with separation, we need to plan for separation. We need to think about separation and plan for it. When we do a process design, we need to understand which parts of, those, of that process are going to be done by different people. When you, people do a process design, they draw a flow map or put some stickies up, there's a lot of implicit assumption built into that, that every one of those tasks is going to be done by somebody who actually is within a few feet of that board because they can come and frequently look and see well, what is that thing about? What's the status of that? So all the planning that we have historically done through the lean training, unfortunately, has a baked in assumption about synchronous work. And hopefully I convinced you a minute ago that synchronized work is, uh, well, there's a lot less of it than people think. We need to think about our tools. This is a common tool, whiteboard with stickies on it. And the usefulness of this tool is directly related to how many feet you are from this tool. If this tool happens to be close by your cubicle, it's a really useful team tool. But just consider somebody who's on the far end of that same room, who has to get up, walk over to refresh their mind about something. This tool is completely useless once you take the elevator, even within the, your same building. And this tool is not even known to exist if you're working in a different office. So this is how a lot of people start because it's cheap, easy, and it seems to do the job. And it does do the job as long as you're really, really close to it. The other area you need to plan for separation is in how you handle your meetings. <laughs> so the concept of stand-up meetings came from the agile world and is now pretty common. Uh, like, don't do a whole show of hands, but just like nod vigorously if you are doing stand-up meetings. Begin nodding. Oh, okay. Some people added hands as well, so there's like two or three stand-ups going on in their life. Um, you ever feel your stand-up meeting is kind of run like this, by the way? Just curious. <laughs> so now let's get to sort of the meat part of the, of the talk. If I have persuaded you that virtual teams already exist, that you're already in one, but no one has pointed that out to you, maybe you can reflect upon the fact that are you really that synchronized? Are people always right next to you? Do they actually come in to work the same hours that you do? Has no one ever gotten sick or had to stay at home waiting for the cable guy? So you're actually already in a virtual team, but I feel like that realization hasn't really been there. People plan as if this mythical team assembles at eight o'clock every morning in this room. People plan as if that team is always available in this room every day. People plan 
as if everyone can see this simple whiteboard. So we need to rethink a lot of that stuff. We can need to rethink in terms of five, six aspects. One is about access, uh, awareness, context, push, pull, and networks. So I will go through each one now. Access needs to be anywhere, anytime. It cannot be based upon your physical proximity to a whiteboard with stickies that are getting dry and peeling off already. It cannot be based upon you having easy access to that thing physically. It needs to be anywhere and it needs to be anytime. It needs to be when you are ready to catch up and see what's going on, right? So it has to be far more flexible than it has been anywhere. So how can something be available anytime and anywhere? Well, that problem has been solved. Everybody has a browser, always has a browser. They carry their browsers with them. It's the new don't, don't leave home without your browser world, right? <laughs> so we can see that if we need to have a solution that provides access anytime, anywhere, it needs to be something that you can get to with a browser, right? That will solve that problem of access. So instead of having something like this, I hope no one recognizes this because I did photograph this in a state agency. So. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, not the standard meeting, but a lot of the other pictures are from the uh, uh, agencies. So this is not going to work, okay? Because this is not accessible anytime, anywhere. But something like this might be, where your cards and your boards live in the browser. So this is an example of an electronic board where these are the cards and these are the columns that represent your you know, sort of workflow. Something goes from planning mm -hmm. to in progress, quality review, and hopefully it gets to done. But sometimes we'll end up in the trash. If we do transition from sticky notes to something that's online, it's not just a matter of convenience. You have actually unlocked all the powers that come with starting to use software, right? So what used to be a, a kind of dried curling up sticky with three mysterious words on it that <laughs> you cannot quite remember whether we're supposed to do more of that or less of that. <laughs> right? Your cards inside the browser can be very much more rich, right? And I can talk later or separately about what, how rich they could be. But the point is, when you open up a card in a browser, you can do stuff with it that you can't do with yellow paper. You could see, for example, what the details around the work are, who's working on it, when it's supposed to get done, and this stuff starts to get really, really interesting. You can see, are there any tasks involved in this project? Before you can do the budget summaries, are there any subtasks that need to be done? Has there been any conversation around it? Has there been any chat, any, any communication? People ask questions and they got answered. Is there content? Of course there's content, you're all in the content business. You consume content and produce some content. The ratio may or may not work for you, but that's what you do. There's incoming content, files, memos, whatever it is, and there's outgoing content, right? So every work item has content associated with it. Do I get it like a hell yeah or something? <laughs> Okay. And now, because we're in the magical world of software, which I love personally, <laughs> I do, seriously. Uh, there's a lot of sarcasm, but not when it comes to software. That is a holy <laughs> subject. <laughs> so, for example, now when I open up this card, which already has a better title than what would have on, the, on a sticky, I can actually see some details around the work, right? So now I've been given this task, this job, I pick it up, and I can see some detail around it. Let's talk next about awareness. Awareness is knowing what's going on. There are two aspects to it. One is it should be fast, ideally real time. So if somebody did something, if you're waiting for it, if you're looking for it, you should see that without any further delay, right? And it also has to be what I would call overarching. Let's talk about the first part. 
let's say I was looking at this card. Can I know if anything has changed on it? And this is an example where like a lot has changed on it. So a system like that should be able to alert you to say, yes, this card is still in progress, but did you know there's like all these messages that you haven't read about it? That somebody's added attachments, maybe some videos or YouTube links or Wikipedia links, whatever it is, Washington code references. And the other aspect of awareness also needs to be overarching. I will willingly bet all the money I have in my wallet right now that there's not one person in this room who works only on one thing. Anybody want to get up to, I think, possibly $100? <laughs> Challenge me. I will challenge you right back, though. Okay? The reality is we work on more than one thing. And if these task boards were easy to use, we would be associated with more than one, one, one of these things, right? So now, whatever system, whatever tools you're using, need, you need to help you step back when necessary and say, okay, I've got like five things going, five teams or boards or activities, projects that I'm working on. Can I step back and see what's due across everything? And stuff like, what matters? What needs my attention? What's overdue across every project that I have any role in? You know, what's high priority or critical, right? So this is what I meant about having a view that is overarching. Does that make sense? Okay. I feel like I'm losing some of you guys. What the context? Context is what adds value to everything. When I was in college in the 80s, I remember learning in, uh, that back then, TV Guide made more money than all the television networks combined. <laughs> so it turned out information about the TV programs was more, worth more than the TV programs. So TV Guide made billions of money simply by providing context. So context means this is not a good tool. Because <laughs> you know what this is? This is one gigantic sewer pipe running through every building <laughs> into which everyone's thoughts about everything across every project is dropped into that sewer. And it's left to you to put a filter through the sewer every day to see whether there's any diamonds that you care about. <laughs> Somebody, you know, they didn't really lose their, their wedding ring or something that I can make <laughs> some value out of. But the problem is fundamentally the channel, you see. You have one email account. So everything that I want to say to you or to, about anything will come to that email account. Right? Maybe we should have our conversations in context. So if I need to talk to you about the legislative summaries work item, I should chat about it on the card. Because you know what the difference is? Now that my conversation is in that card, wherever that card moves, it takes with it the conversation history. <clears throat> right? That's very different from work moving in the physical world and you're trying to figure out which emails refer to it now. Because you know the subject matter line has changed. It's gotten way, way out of off topic with everyone replying all to on everything. Right? So conversations need to be in context. And that's also true for content. If you are working with particular files or you know, web links or SharePoint links that have to do with one work item, they need to be associated with that work item. So it's not okay for you to tell me, you know, K is a shared drive. And if you go to K, you will find everything. And by, I, I do mean everything. <laughs> right? So con uh, content needs to be in, in context. Tasks need to be in context as well. So I think you get the idea of that. Next aspect that needs to change when you're dealing with um, virtual teams. You need to know the difference between push and pull and try to encourage pull 
wherever possible. So what's the problem with push? Push will inevitably come to shove. I'm going to show you. Push is when I say, OK, it's yours now, and I hand it to you. And she says, it's yours now, and hands it to you. And everybody just pushes stuff onto you. There's a big difference between all of us pushing work onto you versus all of this suggest, uh, signaling that the work is ready to be picked up and you actively pulling the work. Because when you pull a work item, which means like take a card and put your name and face on it, that means you're actually taking ownership of that work. Me putting your face on it means nothing other than an expectation or understanding that you should probably do this work. And me putting a date on that is just me playing with dates. <laughs> Not only should you do it, but I think you should get it done by tomorrow. <laughs> right? So when you move from push to pull, we're talking about a very fundamental shift. Any questions on that? Yeah? I hope you're saving up something for the Q&A because I'm going to run out of talk otherwise. This is kind of a, a nitty gritty thing, but part of the push versus pull is, how many folks are uh, familiar with work in progress limits, width limits? Okay, enough folks. So when you have a workflow that consists of various stages, you need to really understand what the capacity is of any one stage because that's where your bottleneck will form. So don't push or pull things, for, for example, for a quality check if you know the quality check is done by only one person who is not full-time. It doesn't matter how many people are to the left of that and getting stuff ready for quality check. You need to understand that the work in progress limit for that phase, which means that column on your board, is like one or two tasks, depending on how big they are. Next, people and roles. Who's who? There are four fundamental roles to consider. We have the organizers. And this is how they think of themselves. You know, supreme leaders of all their teams. Actually, this is not what an organizer should do or even attempt to do in a virtual team. Um, because when the team is distributed, you really don't have that kind of control over anybody. <laughs> Probably didn't have it before either, but you certainly don't have that control anymore, right? So you need to get off your high flaming horse oh. <laughs> and understand that you are an organizer, right? Not the general of all generals. We also have participants. Participants are people who have to work together willingly or unwillingly, but they recognize that they have to work together in some way. So these are what I consider. So earlier in the talk, I said something about a team having a defined boundary. Well, actually, it's more like, you know, guys know about uh, umbra and penumbra from physics class way back. You know, when you see the light, there's a dark shadow, and then there's another shadow, and then there's no shadow. So the innermost team of people who are actually working are the participants. But there's also another uh, layer of people out there who have some involvement with the project, but they're not really participants. They're observers, right? They're people who sort of show up for meetings, are watching, and so forth. And that might be perfectly okay, as long as you recognize that their role is that of an observer, not a participant. A typical observer would be a stakeholder who has an interest in your project, but is not actually involved in producing your project. They want to know where things are so that they can set their own expectations. So they need to be able to have that same real-time view, any way, any place, as those who are doing the work. But they probably should not be allowed to go in and mess with the board because the involvement is so sporadic, even seemingly random, that you don't want them to come and say, oh, yeah, this looks pretty good. You know, maybe it should be ready for QA. Let me just move it for QA. No, no. These are, these are people in Kerikos language, we would call them visitors. 
and others we call team members. Team members and visitors are very different things. Finally, we have a category of people that really don't belong in us, <laughs> right? Tourists are what I call people who just come, you know, look at the wrong things, make themselves unpopular, <laughs> and then leave, but then are replaced by others, right? The way to deal with tourists is to make it really easy for someone who has some curiosity about what you're doing to see what you're doing without creating any burden on the team. So these are really gonna be low impact, low, like no footprint tourists, All right? I mean, I think this photograph is probably taken in Barcelona because I visited there. I think this is the old part of the city. And I can see why somebody wrote this. It is a beautiful part of the city, mm -hmm. but it would be much better served if most people could get a lot of the value of Barcelona without necessarily all showing up on that same holiday weekend, you know? Okay. Finally, we have to talk about networks. Networks is not something that's part of your traditional thinking, certainly not part of lean thinking. I've never heard a lean practitioner talk about networks. And networks are relationships, groups of people. Facebook's a good example where the size changes and the shape changes. And they're very, very fluid. So you don't, shouldn't plan for an organiza organizational structure using the pharaohs as, a, you know, as inspiration. <laughs> the pharaohs could create pyramids knowing that that pyramid would never change except without the actual intervention, right? That's not how organizations really exist, not how you exist. You actually exist in this world. I, I'm once again willing to bet all the money I carry, uh, not credit cards, the cash I carry <laughs> um, in, my, in my wallet right now to bet that you all have multiple things going on. And if you really thought about it, some of them involve strong connections with some people, some involve weak connections, and that keeps changing. A pyramid has no place in your work life. Instead, we need to start thinking about the idea that I got pulled into this project with you, I'm gonna have a relationship, a connection with you, and hopefully the project will end soon, then I will naturally go away, or I may get pulled away to another project, in which case it will break faster than anyone expected. Right? But what does that mean? It means there has to be no real cost, no time involved for me to set up that connection and then to tear it down when necessary. What am I contrasting this with? What is my idea of a pyramid in your life? SharePoint. Have you guys tried setting up a project in SharePoint? Yeah. How many people know who they have to call to set up a pyramid? Uh, or project in SharePoint, right? So SharePoint is the old model. It assumes that if we are working on a project, it'll probably go on for years. <laughs> so it says, it's okay that it takes six weeks to set it up. Like, what's six weeks in six years, you know? <laughs> right? That's not a network model at all. It is a real distaste for SharePoint based on personal experience that caused me to, uh, to quit my last full-time job and start my own company to produce a product that would be as different from SharePoint as it possibly could be. <laughs> okay, I hope some of you guys have questions because that's the part now. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? So the question was, do our cards have a section or a way to fit in time? In Carica, it's not a separate field. People who do track estimates uh, usually write that in the details part of the card, saying this card is estimated to take two weeks. If it needs to get done by two weeks, they use that as a due date. So everyone knows it needs to get done by due date, right? So that's normally how uh, people use it in character. 
for the summary of the question, I think it was, is there a way to embed a process inside a board like Kerika? Yeah, short answer is, oh yes. <laughs> because one thing Kerika does, by the way, which other two tools don't do, so I will kind of sing my praises on that, um, is you can create a template for how a process ought to be done. If you come upstairs later, I'll show you examples of that. For example, you may say, you know, this is our best practice for onboarding new employees. All the way from making sure that somebody is there to meet them on their first day, to making sure that their office was set up before their the first day, right? And there's a whole bunch of things. You can make those cards, right? And if there are forms that need to be filled out, you can attach them, or the links anyway, right? And you can make that whole thing a board, a, board, a template. A template is a board you can use as many times as you want. So you can just create that and say, this is our best process for onboarding new employees. So the next time anyone in our organization needs to onboard an employee, for example, they should just use our template. And they will get a pre-made Kanban board for them with all the basic work items and the basic workflow. That's a starting point. They're, they're not, the templates don't, uh, you know, they're not like carved in stone because you don't do anything in stone. Um, but it just gives you a project you know, in a can, right? And those things have been very useful. And what, now I can actually say good things about Lean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wrong place, wrong time, I know. <laughs> but the, one of the things about Lean is that it really puts an emphasis on uh, looking at how well you're doing, thinking about how you can do better. So let's say you have a process for onboarding employees. And you start to get feedback saying, you know what, this could be better if you added this one step, or this one step that you have. I don't know how long it's been there, but nobody does that. There's no need for it. What happens today if, as lean practitioners, you find a way to improve a process? Most probably, you will have meetings and so forth, but the end product will be a memo that gets distributed. What happens to that memo, I don't know, right? In the best case scenario, it will, be, it will re replace something in a three-ring binder in the right place. But with an online tool, especially one like Kerika, you could have that realization at any moment in time and just go in there and change it. And now you've improved your process for onboarding your employees. And the next person who comes along, the very next second later, as long as they're using the, the templates, they will always be using the best available process you have. So the publication time goes down to zero. The distribution time goes down to zero. Now think, how much more likely are you to do process improvements if there wasn't a lot of shovel work at the end of it to get, get it out there? How much more likely are you to do process improvement if you knew the effect of that improvement will be, will be instant? A sub-second later, that is a new process, right? That's a great thing, I think, because it, you, know, you guys come here wanting to figure out how to improve your processes. You go back, you develop ideas, but I think in a lot of places, there's a huge burden afterwards. Like, okay, I've got this new process. Did I put it on the right place in SharePoint? Will anyone notice, <laughs> right? Is there another SharePoint site out there that is mostly like mine, which people are going to by mistake? <laughs> right? In any case, I would strongly encourage all of you guys to come back because you know, if you have questions that I cannot answer here, you need to seek the white wizard. <laughs> I started thinking at a fundamental level, work is actually not a mechanical process. And tools like Microsoft Project, which had been around since the, at least the mid 80s, they, they took a very mechanical view of the world. You know, like I could smooth you around like, like little machines. You will come in at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, <laughs> right? You and everyone else. So, and, and the system would calculate how much output you could produce, but it had no room for the fluctuations that life produces. 
and it had no way of dealing with a very rapid change that uh, we have in our lives where something is really urgent to today, right up to it and you're not working on it, and now tomorrow there's a fire that no one expected that you need to drop the surgeon to work and suddenly shift. We don't know how long you've been there, and you might be finished sooner, and then you're back. So that kind of rapid change, I tried doing that with Microsoft Project, and I found that I was spending the majority of my day uh, just trying to get projects to accurately reflect what's going on. The most complicated project I did was in Europe. In nine months from a starting stand, a standing start, nine months we went from three people in a room to a stock exchange that worked across every European country, was fully regulated, and dealt with all stocks, and did so at a, I think, 1 30th of the cost what you had done before. The hardest part of that project was trying to persuade my boss not to ask me for any more status reports, because every one of those took me away from doing my job. <laughs> and to the very end, he kept hoping for a Gantt chart. Uh. And I said, I will do one once I know what the plan is. <laughs> But you want a stock exchange, and even the London stock exchange, uh, the London financial regulator, didn't know how to regulate us because no one had proposed this kind of a thing. There was, had been, this was the first cross-border stock exchange. Right? We actually did launch that project. We did actually create a stock exchange that was accessible across the country, uh, not the country, across the continent. And we did it nine months, starting with three people in one rented room. Expanded to 250 people, and we managed to pull it off. But I could never create a Gantt chart for it. Okay, the first thing uh, to summarize the question: She has nine project teams working for her, each with their project managers. They all got a lot going on. I think the first thing to do in that situation is recognize that you're not going to get that stability that you may have been trained to expect. If someone shows you a Gantt chart, at best, it was accurate at the very second it was printed. And so hopefully you get pick it up right from the printer, read it, and put it right in the trash in the shredder after that. Because you know, its utility is already over. It has a very short life cycle. So understand that, right? That understand that your teams, your project managers, are dealing with, wrestling with, all this change, right? So maybe, maybe be willing to move away from status reports. I, I run a company with people on two continents and we have never produced a status report. We also produce fewer than a dozen emails in the entire year because that kind of routine stuff where I just sort of push stuff on you, hey, you might be interested, let me just email you. Oh, you remember you asked me for this like six months ago and I've been sending it to you every week since then? <laughs> right? I assume you're still reading them. Right? So it's, it's more of a cultural change and we can talk about that because I, I suspect that sometime I'll run through my, my time here. Um, but, okay, I'm at zero minutes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have run through my time. Uh, thank you very much for coming. That's my direct email. That's my personal email, my work email, that's, that's everything. Okay, thank you all for coming.